Okay, so in the first session we heard the case of Willibald. The data model was introduced. We have two different sources. We need to bring them together. We have different data issues in the data set on purpose. And I will present the solution of a company called 2150 Data Vault Builder, and our product is called Data Vault Builder. My name is Peter Belles. Um, I'm working in data warehousing since the year 2000. I've worked with classical Inman models, Kimball modeling, different tools. And back in 2012, I came across certain challenges that we needed to do near real-time warehousing, that we needed to become agile in data warehousing, and we couldn't solve that with classical data modeling approaches. So we started using Data Vault, and which turned out were really great, except that we needed to automate it. Because within the first two weeks, we realized if you try to do Data Vault approaches manually, uh, as a colleague of mine told it, it's a job killer. So if you really want to get into troubles, try it. So you either do your own automation, which could be fine for you, or you use a tool, but don't try to create everything manually. That's my recommendation. So I will do like just introduction in two minutes. So I will skip through the slides. So if you want to see them on, on properly, come back later. We will focus this time only on the solution that we have here because we have only 45 minutes. So we are based in Zurich. And our main driver that we do is that we are starting with the business model. We believe that business models are more stable than technical implementations, that we need to change technical implementations over time because we believe that the lifetime of a data warehouse solution is about somewhere between 10 and 15 years. So the business stays stable. And if the business doesn't stay stable, don't worry. Your technological implementation will change anyway. So that's why we're starting with the business model. And it brings us that we can communicate with the business users, it helps the IT to automate stuff, and that's what I will show today. We are doing real-time implementation, so while I change the model in the tool, it changes the implementation, it covers everything. We will see that with infrastructure, automation, deployment, we will have these parts, and that's a nice thing that we are able to show that in the demo. We have small clients, big clients, we go through that. Data Vault 2.0 certifications in the process, and let's go now to the technical content here. We have a core data warehouse, and this is the persistent layer that we have in here, and it's modeled at the physical level as a data vault warehouse. But we believe that if we do data modeling, it should be at a conceptual and logical data modeling. So if you say, I don't know anything about data vault, don't worry. We are doing the technical implementation below it. We abstract that. And on top, you have the data model. If you know about ontologies, if you know about ER modeling, and, or any other kind of data modeling, probably you will be fine because it's about concepts, it's about relation, it's about attributes describing these concepts. And this didn't change, I think, for the past 50 years. Additionally, we have a built-in staging module so you can directly connect to the data, get it from different data sources. For this use case, we decided to load the Willibald data on a SQL server because we got the data sets in two formats. One was CSV files, which we could read as well directly, but the nice thing about the insert statements we got for the SQL Server files was that we got data types. Thank you for that. And the cool thing is that I think the second group that will present used the CSV files, so we found similar or other data problems because they used the other data sets, so we tested both of them. That's really cool. Then by defining the business key, we can go into the raw vault. In case your business key is not really proper, and we heard this, uh, it could be missing. It could be that there are null values. Uh, it could be that there are duplicates. We have the possibility to load into our PSA or data lake area where you can load based on technical keys, do your cleanup, and go into the data warehouse. Now, on the output side, and this is where I tell the people, don't worry, that we are implementing it here on the technical level as a data vault for storage and making deployment simpler and become agile. For the output, if you want to have a third normal form output, and don't ask why you would do that, but some people use Cognos or business objects and they prefer to have a third normal form output. You can do that because third normal form is less normalized than a data vault, so you can do that visually. You can create your dimensional models with, with dimensions and facts, and I liked really that he mentioned before that in the beginning you don't know if it will become a fact or a dimension, and it's really the case that sometimes stuff that is in one reported dimension is the fact in another, so here we are just creating conformed objects. I even don't call it conformed dimensions as Kimball did it. And these conformed objects you can use in your different rep uh, reports. And they can be denormalized at different levels. So 
we have a lot of data scientists today that want to have completely flat tables, that's fine. We have people that are doing data mesh, they want to have more data products. So you really decide here, and you can have several interfaces at the same grain at the same time to deliver it to different users. We are mainly an ELT tool, so everything what we will see today, the, the demo that we now constructed was built on Snowflake, but it would work with Oracle, SQL Server, all variants, Postgres, XSOL, whatever you like from the list, or BigQuery later this year. Are there any questions on the basic architecture so far? Yeah. Databricks is supported as a source in here. So we have a lot of sources like JDBC sources, NoSQL sources through Trino. We can connect to Python script. So as a source, yes, not as a target. And the reason is that we are testing again and again different target technologies. And with Databricks, you get better and better joint performance if you have like one big table and small tables. But if you have several big tables, and in the course we are really hyper-normalized, the performance can go down. And that's why it's not one of our preferred platforms. I'm not saying that we will do, never do it, but it works currently better on relational databases. And what are we doing differently? Because probably you will see that again and again today. That's why I'm explaining a little bit. You have usually a modeling tool. A modeling tool can be as well an Excel sheet where you capture your metadata. You have a repository, which can be the same Excel sheet, or if you have a front-end tool, like a database, and then you press the button and patterns translate the metadata into a real world implementation. The problem with this approach is that the first thing is, is it works pretty well in the beginning, but as soon as somebody starts changing the implementation without changing the model, you get into trouble. Now you say, yeah, so let's prevent that. But the problem is, Sunday afternoon you have a production incident, so a developer goes in and fixes your data warehouse physical implementation. So you should be happy, but Sunday afternoon he forgot to put it back, and we have seen this so many times that the model and the implementation falls apart, that we decided for a different approach. We removed the repository. We are working now in the tool, and in real time we are implementing whatever needs to be implemented. And now people get crazy and say, but what happens with my production database? You're changing it while you're changing the model. No, for sure not. Um, we are doing this in a development environment if you're a small company or you can even use sandboxes. And this is very nice, and that's why you use now Snowflake in this use case. You can create your own sandbox within a few minutes. You just zero copy clone your database where everything is stored that we do. You connect a new Data Vault Builder instance, which is delivered as Docker containers, and within a few minutes, you have your perfect own sandbox where you can work and use a Git flow-based deployment process to deploy your changes with branching, merging, and everything. Good. So let's go on, that we come to the demo. Um, by the way, we deliver all the patterns with the tool. We deliver upgrade scripts over time. So really, to start up, the modeling that we did here didn't took us any time, which is not true. It took about two minutes. I typed in one command saying, I want to get a new instance. It downloaded the software, started it. You don't need to install it. And I was ready to start modeling with the data that we got from Willibald. So yes, it runs everywhere. We have different modules. I come to that back later. So. And now we are here where we want to start. So the first thing what we do is we talk to the business user about which kind of concepts do exist in their business. The concepts become these blue boxes, which are for us the core business concepts. Why I don't call them hubs? Because we believe that this modeling should be at a much simpler level, which is first the conceptual modeling. So these things are, in fact, concepts, so we can capture the name, we can capture the metadata, and talk to the business users about them, what is in your business. And now one important point is, and then we, that we have seen in the first presentation, is what you do like with an order line. Is the order line a link, or is it a concept on its own? And we believe it's a concept on its own. It has its own keys. The order line can exist over a longer period in time, either if you, even if you exchange the product for this order line, because it could be that the customer orders like, I don't know, some tomatoes, and you say, okay, I don't have exactly this kind of tomatoes on stock, but I called him and he tells that like the green tomatoes are fine as well, if such thing exists. So you can exchange the product, but still it's the same order line, so you would see a change instead of a removal and reappearance of the product. So this is how we see this kind of modeling. So that's why the order and the order line is in here. 
And in the first step, we don't look at the data yet. So we create just a concept. We have something called the subject areas. Today in data mesh, you would probably call this like data domains, grouping of core business concepts into topics because we have here certain clients that have several hundred of these core business concepts in here and you wouldn't find anything anymore. The next thing that we start adding is the relations. So we talk to the clients and say, how do things relate to each other? And we have seen the data model, model in the morning. There are other, already so many to one relations and stuff like that. And the interesting point is that here, if you look exactly, you see, I don't know if you see it in the last row, but there are arrows pointing in certain directions. So we already model the expected cardinalities that are coming from the source system. If you're a hardcore data model modeler, you will ask, why are you doing that? These are always many to many tables that represent the links. Yes, we store it that way, but for interpretation, for creating the history of the relations, how they change over time, we need to know what we expect. By that, we can create the so-called driving views. We can automate the dimensional model because we should allow always to go from a finer to a coarser grain, but not the other way around. Otherwise, we duplicate lines and stuff like that. So this is the main thing. And honestly, here is where we spend some time in the beginning. But some time doesn't mean like nine months, like I did in my first job in finance, where we did a really huge enterprise data model. And when we were finished, the requirements changed in the meantime. No, it's about like a workshop with the business users for about two and a half hours getting like 10 to 20 core business concepts in here and start modeling. The cool thing about Willibald, it was not much bigger, so we finished this in a very short workshop. We talked about different things like, is functionality really a thing? Yeah, the world is not black and white, I guess. So after creating here the data model, just with the elements and the relations, we started to connect it with data. And we decided to go first for the workshop because we believed or assumed it will be a little bit cleaner data. But in the same second, we started modeling here. In the background, all the tables in the database necessary to store this data that will come later are already created. In the same second, you add an element here in the database, it's added. So we can go in here, we have this element, and we are very standardized. So all the hubs that you create with Data Vault Builder, we have now more than 150 instances worldwide, will always have the same technical prefix. You don't need to configure it, you can't configure it, but the benefit of it is that two years down the road, if you need to update something with your hubs because something changed, maybe on Snowflake or on the other database platform, we can send you the update scripts, we will find the tables, and you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to write your own documentation. By the way, all of this metadata is always in real time accessible as well through the database. So if you work at the database level, you will see exactly the same metadata like in the tool. So the second step is we go and connect to the source system. We have a lot of built-in source connectors. Here I decided to load from a SQL server and we decided to make it a little bit more complicated. Michal told there is no bitemporal data in there. We added bitemporality, why? Uh, for reproducibility, because it's artificial data delivered on three de different delivery dates, and we wanted to be able to create automated tests and rerun everything, so we added a delivery date for all of these three deliveries. That's why now here the small clock icon appears. We just select a column which contains like the delivery date, which is our technical timeline that we want to store, and this means that everything that is created later now will be created as bitemporal satellites. So it will store the timeline of the delivery, which is our main timeline, which we report on. And we have as well the timeline of when it was written to the data vault. Because it could be that there will be backwards correction. That's always as well a funny thing with bitemporal data. So you get it, usually you would expect that it goes forward, but there can be re-deliveries. And the funny thing is we had this because we figured out in certain cases that there were some problems with the data, some intentional, some not so intentional, so we needed to reload like the first and second delivery again and again, and this turned out very beneficial that we could just go forwards and backwards. The next thing is I go in there and I start profiling the data. So the next layer is I can really visualize the data. It's not a reporting tool, it's really for visualizing the data. So I looked into 
Here we have the Geschlecht, the sex, and we figure out that we don't have only male and female, we have as well diverse, really nice example, and one record has no sex, not even now, okay. And the next step is now we need to connect the data model with the, <laughs> were you aware of that? <laughs> Good. The next thing is that we now need to connect the, do I have a laser pointer here? Yeah. So we have the model in here, we have the data staged here, now we need to connect it. And this, this is happening by selecting the business key. And this is again something where we go back to the business user and we ask them what is the business key. Now in this artificial example it was a little bit simpler because we have not the differentiation between technical and business key which is usually a real pain in real, real use cases. So here the customers told us that like the Kunde ID is really the use case and the cool thing is that we have as well here while we are defining this kind of business keys in the process a tool that checks if this is unique. And we heard in the first session that we have different addresses of residence for one customer. So if I try to load this data as a satellite of the customer, I would need to add a, like a multi-active satellite or as we prefer it, we do like sub-partition hubs where we really connect it. But at, for sure when I try to adjust the satellite to the customer, it told me, hey, this is not unique. It opened the second window and it's not just telling me it's not unique, this kind of values. It gives me the customer which have really a problem where we have duplicates and I can open one of the data sets and I can look what are the differences for the same key. And this is the main thing when you create data vaults. If you get the business key wrong in the beginning, it will be very, very expensive to change it later and that's why we test it before we create it and if you would model it besides the database, you would either run into problems or you need to do it manually and check the data for yourself. Next thing is, and uh, we heard it, if you go here, creating like the raw vault model, connecting it by keys, creating satellites, creating link loads, driving views and everything, you will arrive there at some point. The point is you don't finish here you need to somehow output the data. And my personal opinion, and this goes honestly back to Inman that was saying, never give people access to your core. For two reasons, they will mess up, they don't understand it, what normalization is. The second thing is you block all your refactoring. Still, we did it in the past because it was so complicated to do it. And now through automation, we can achieve that just by visually selecting from our model, because it captured already what are the concepts, what are the relations, and what are the expected cardinalities, we can now select the columns, it will create in the first version always a virtual view, so we don't need to reload the data, and immediately we see the output that we will get. And we can go back to our data source system, deliver if you see some problematic stuff, or we can publish it and give a first access to our business users. Is this data perfect? No, for sure not. We haven't created any business rule yet, on it, no manipulations, we haven't filtered it, we haven't whatever checked. But from this moment in time, and this is really like 10 or 15 minutes later from the start of working with the data, they get the first input and they are not blind anymore. Because if you were ever on the business user side, usually it's very, very difficult if the technical people come and say, give us your business rules, but we don't give you the data yet. So, that's what we solve here. The next thing is then the business user comes back and say yes we want to have some logic so we have this place where we can put in logic and logic is here stored as SQL snippets. The good thing is that you can split up your rules into smaller blocks. You can add comments. We will version it so every time you change a business rule even during the day even if you don't have committed yet to the git repository version is saved so if you do some mistake and you know in the in the morning it was running i just want to return to a, to an earlier version everything is locked and and captured in the background while we were modeling automatically the data lineage is created and this is derived from the model we have on the left side the source system we have the staging tables, we have the core hub, then if necessary and only if I create output in STD type 2 format, 
The tool automatically knows it needs to create some pit tables. And yes, we had some requests to see some changes in the data. So we needed to create historic output. And this was now based on the external timeline that we delivered here. So we really see then these three deliveries. And if we reload the data, it, it fixed the stuff over here. Then we have the denormalization level, business rule level, and presentation. It, it, it looks pretty crowded. So I filtered it a little bit down and even more down. And now we go to a data flow that we can understand. So how is the customer hub filled, from which sources, where the data is released? And the cool thing is that all of this metadata that we generate is not only available in the, database, uh, in the tool directly, but as well at the database level. So everything that we create in real time can be accessed in the database. So if you want to take this kind of information and present it in your Power BI Tableau click report, alongside with the data that's possible, you just connect to the database and load this kind of metadata into your report. And you visualize this however you like it. What happened at, as well at the same time? While we were modeling, because we know where the data is coming from, and here I have now the roadshow system, that, that's the second source of data, it knows automatically how to create a job. It can be run at any point in time in the tool. It can be scheduled, there is a built-in scheduler, or like many clients, use an external scheduler, which can be UC4, Chronicle, or Airflow. They can trigger through a REST API directly this kind of job. So you don't need to take care about parallelization, about logging, about error handling. This is happening automatically. You just need to say, I want to load this source system. And then everything starts and is being loaded. And here now, the very nice thing that we had is that our second source system has only one table. And we need to normalize out the data. And the data world builder can do that by design. So you can just define the load into the different tables. And you define for every load if you expect it to be unique. So like here from the order to the order line, we expect it to be unique because that's the grain that was promised to us that we are checking. And we talked to the business user. They told us that for every product, there is always only one line in one order when they sell on site. So we, that's how we designed it. But for the other, like the order is normalized. The attributes of the order are normalized, stuff like that that works automatically. At the same time, the documentation is created through all the layers. All of this is accessible as well in the database. So as mentioned, you could go like get your hub list. You can get your link list. You can get all the business information directly as well, always in real time as well in the database level. And when you're finished, when you're through all the layers and you created everything, you want to deploy it. And now we have here two means of deployment. One is the simplified deployment, which works like classical data warehouse deployment probably you did in the past. You take two environments. You let the tool compare the two environments. And it will give you the differences. And it will show you exactly what changed. You can click on the button, and it will generate you a deployment script. And this works for smaller teams pretty well. But if you're in a bigger team, you probably want to have a more controlled way of deploying. You have maybe a release manager. You need to version your code. So you can as well click a button. And if I say you can click a button, there's an API for that as well. And it downloads you the full description of the data warehouse. Uh, and you can check it into Git. And if you ever worked with tools like SSIS and you try to use Git, or if you use some other automation tools and you try to get, use Git, you know what the pains are. Especially if you have big files with all the stuff in, or if you try to check in change scripts that Git was not built for, we are here really creating one file per object, which is very, very reduced to the minimum, which is at the logical level, which is sorted, prettified, that we don't get any false positives. So you can just take this and store it into Git. And you can branch your models. You can merge your models. And that's usually a basic test that I would recommend you to do if you want to work with any tools, if you can branch your data models. Then if you run it, we have, and that's now version 7. That is right now, shortly before our, uh, being deployed. We have redesigned the whole deployment process. Now the deployments will run in parallel. This means even if you have bigger models with several thousand of objects, that it will be deployed very fast to your production system, that all the dependencies are taken care for. And let's be honest, if you see it here that we overworked it, it means that there was room to, for improvement in version 6, but 
yet. Now in version seven, with the experience we got in the past years, we, we really rewrote it and that's something we do regularly. Instead of just adding more and more features, we sometimes take whole modules, we take all the experience, overwork it, and that's the part that we as an automation tool provider can do that you probably in your company can't do that we have time for this kind of sorting out technical debt. How much time do I have left? 20 minutes, that's great. Good, so this is kind of stuff that we check into Git. Probably if you look at that, you will understand what it is without any explanation and that's the idea that even if I have to merge data models in Git, I will understand what I'm doing, I will understand if somebody changed some attributes of an element or if it's a new element, the file appears, if it's removed, the file disappears. So this makes it very natural if you are familiar with the Git flow, how to work with it. If you want to do anything in the tool of what I showed so far with some more automation, no worries. For everything, there is a REST API. This is here just uh, from Chrome, the developer tools. So you can look up while you're working with the tools which kind of API calls you need to do. So you have endpoints that are documented. You just need to send some payload, which is pretty simple. And then you can do everything which is done in the tool as well from external REST API. So you can integrate it as well with other modeling tools if you like that, with schedulers, with data catalogs, whatever you like. If we want to go to scheduling, so after we finish the work, we can go in, we can just set the schedules, we can set to run it twice a day, every minute, every second, whatever you like, and it will just run. You can put in as well, at the end of every job, your custom SQL, so if you have something like data deletions in GDPR and you have a workflow that would work through your deletion list, you can just trigger it after every load. So load your data, check if maybe some data that should have been deleted is added and you can delete it right away again that it's for sure not stored in there. For your operations people, you get the status over all the system. So you would see if something failed. Yes, we have no failed jobs in here, but that's because it's a very nice system and everything worked. But you would see here if some source delivers didn't deliver the information. And what happens if, if there is a problem? There are two categories of problems, self-healing and non-self-healing. First thing is like we figured out that most of the errors that we get are stupid stuff like somebody extended the column length from 30 to 40 characters on Friday afternoon and our job fails on the weekend. And we really hated it, so we really sorted it out. If we have a schema drift like this, we sort this out automatically, we will be able to load it as well, if somebody changed the data type of a column and we can implicitly convert it and don't lose any data, we will continue loading. We raise a warning that you can look at it if this was intentional, but still we continue loading. As well, if somebody deletes a source column, we heal that and say, the column is not there. The best thing we can do is load it as a null value and we will continue loading, raise a warning. But if somebody changes a number column to a text, then we would stop and say, okay, here is something that you need to fix. As well, we, we talked about loading stuff into the core layer. We can sort out, there are a lot of things. The only thing that we are not sorting out automatically is if the business keys that you define, they should be unique. So you define intentionally the grain of your source table corresponds to a hub, should be the same, then we will fail the load, but only this part of your whole load and let you fix it. And I will show you then in the live environment how you will see that and how you can directly see what the problem is to fix it. Good, no idea what this is. So, now historize data. Automatically, the whole data vault that we are loading, you don't need to do anything, is creating a STD type two history. And we're historizing everything. And we are doing it in a simple way. We check first, is a key already known, if not, we just insert it so we don't lose any performance for comparison. But if it's already known, we check if the values are still the same and we are creating a history. But in the output layer, you can decide if you want to get just the latest record. So it will automatically just give you as of now presentation. This is probably the 80% use case for most of you. But we heard like if you're maybe in the insurance business, you want to get the full history. 
and you get here a nice low time and low time end flag. And if you have bi-temporal data, now we have really our external timeline that is presented here. We took always the la latest order date to figure out when the data was delivered. And we get here a nice history of the different records. So for all of this, you just need to specify what you want to achieve and the tool is taken care of. You have always a full history, even if you don't output it. And if you want to output it, it will create all the necessary pit tables, but only if you really need them, not just for fun. Now, so let's go into special use cases. And here on the left side, you see now the data vault module. And on the right side, you see the output module. And now we see that the data model changes a little bit. So here in the data vault module, we have the product category. And we have here something that's a concept that we have invented is called alias hub. And why have we invented that? It makes it much more clear what the category is and what the parent is by creating here an alias. So as well, if you look at the database level to the link, you will know what is the finer grain, what is the coarser grain, and, and you will see that. Now it stores just the data coming from the source into this relation. By the way, this green thing is the identity, so this is not a concept on its own, it's just an alias. You can use this as well for role playing if you have like the same concept and it needs to have different names in your reports because they're used like on source country and destination country for a shipment. Then this is the identity and here we have a relation. And now this relation can be traversed several times. And now in the output module, we can see exactly that. We have taken from the product some attributes. We have taken from the first product category some attributes. Then we walked through the parent product category, took there some attributes, and here again. This means we don't need to write a line of code to output the full product dimension if there's a defined number of levels and if the stuff is balanced. So let's be honest, if we have like some an unbalanced tree, if we have here like 20 levels of of, here, of, of hierarchies, I wouldn't do it that way, then I would use a classical CTE, I would put that put in the business rule part where I can use proper SQL to let do the database the work. But here, for simple cases, you don't need to write anything, it's just visually designed to output the data. As well, we have some special cases that we had in the data. And the problem here was like, the product category arrived at least in our insert data with spaces at the end. <laughs> I don't know, did you have the same in the CSV data? No, good. And usually the proper way to solve that in the data vault approach would be to load the data as it is, clean it up, use it again. In this case, we talked to the business user and they promised us this is just a mistake. There will be never be differences between the business key and the business key with a space? Don't laugh. There are source system where yeah, there are, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's really, really dangerous if you do always a right trim. Why? Let's imagine that you have a master data system and the people can enter stuff manually. And somebody <laughs> enters it without a space and somebody with a space and then they create relations. If you always right trim, you unify the two records, you unify the relations, and you can never sort it out again. And you're not auditable anymore. That's why we don't use our trim always. It's really here to show that if there is a real use case, you understand the risks, and you want to do it, you can as well modify the queries we're sending to the source system. As well, sometimes you need to filter out like two or three records. Like you know there is some crap in your, uh, some challenging data in your source system, and you're, you, you report it to your source system and you say, you need to delete these rows. They cr they're creating a big mess and they say, we can't. We have no access to it. It's like at the database level. So you could filter out stuff like here. Important, this is outside of the data world we are. And this is really how we see it. We, we try to recommend to use the, the standard data vault patterns as much as possible, but sometimes you need to break out and in the real world you need to be able to, to put in your, your exceptions. Good. Um, before I go, I can jump here to the live demo. First thing, thank you, Michael. Uh, I believe you sp have more work with it than we had to, to implement it. And 
because I can't show everything how we created it. I just showed you the result. And you need to trust me that it was really, really nice and everything worked out. But if you really want to see it and you have a little bit less than three hours time, you can go to YouTube because we didn't implement the use case once, we implemented it twice. First, my colleague Simon did it and he worked out all the data problems. So we reported it back and we asked about how to do it, we did all the discussions, we have the business users, and then in a second session, I recorded how I create a use case again. So for sure, it's not realistic in would it be how it's in the real company, you know, you have all the discussions, you need to understand it, but from a tool perspective, except for five minutes that I forgot after lunch to hit the record button, but it's marked in the video, it's really in real time how we recreate everything. And for sure, you would then go into the creating the reports, you would get the feedback, so don't expect that you create your data warehouse in, in, in three hours. The real use case to create everything and create as well the output, get it validated, uh, get the special use cases report on the Yedi report and stuff like that took about two days. So that's a little bit different. Just working in a tool is short. The real use case takes longer and it was not like two days in a row, but it was like working two hours, asking questions, getting back, stuff like that. Good, but that we as well, we have I think a few minutes left. So we can go here really in the live demonstration. Let's load the bookmark. And this is the data model as it looks like. And we can go here in really interactively into every element. We see the loads that are there, we see if we expect that stuff is unique or not. We have here some prefixing for, for the webshop stuff because we were, uh, for the roadshow stuff because we were afraid that it could be that the same order number is used in the webshop and on, on the roadshow system. It is not because all the roadshow stuff is prefixed anyway, but thank you for that, but still. <laughs> and the cool thing is as we are working here interactively with the database, we can always go and check as well the data content so we will see immediately how it looks like, we can group stuff, and right after creating something, we can test it. So let's assume that we want to add here a new concept and we want to like create here products uh, from for the TDWI subject area. And this is how much it takes to add a concept. Yes, for sure, we would need to add here as well some description, talk to the business users about it, but already in the same moment that I added it here to the model, the table in Snowflake in that case, that's one of the databases that we support, was already created and we see now how we see standardization and customization. So that it's called products TDWI, it's completely up to you to choose, but that we have four columns, it's given by the data vault approach that we're following, that we have underscore H for the hash key and underscore BK for the business key is given by the tool. And this ensures that even three or five or 10 years down the road, if we need to send you an update script, change the data types of these columns, we will find them on the database because in all the 150 installations, they are called the same. Additionally, you don't need to write the documentation. You can go to our webpage that's publicly available, the documentation, and you will see exactly what underscore H means. So if somebody asks you about it, about documentation, you just reference them to the webpage and they will get it. Now the next thing is that we need to connect it with data. So let's assume that we did the first step, the data modeling. So we go to the staging area. So let's add here as well a new source system. And I will connect just to the same SQL server that we used in here. So I have the list of supported source systems. And uh, that's a good question. No, we do it differently. I just take a source system that already exists and I create a new table. Um, I select just all the columns, I could rename them, I could change the data types, but I go in here and I just call the table differently than it was in the source system. And again, we see now the benefit of direct implementation. So what does happen now? It creates the target tables, it creates the ETL flow, and it starts loading the data. This means that a few seconds later, hopefully, we will see how good the network connection is here. 
Um, we will see that this new data table is staged. The data is loaded. And I don't need to worry about the internet connection because the server is running in Zurich and directly talking to Snowflake and to the SQL server. Good. Uh, and we could do now here as well some profiling on this data table. Uh, that's the wrong one. I want to take the staging table. Uh, yeah. I was just doing that that you see that it's a real live demo and no recording. Okay. So, and we can like take here something like the, the distance that you need for the next three and it will analyze now what data is in there and it takes some time because now it's downloading the data here to my laptop. Um, and we can do like a tree map so you get, we get a value distribution and we, we see now probably the contrast on the beamer is not too good. Um, how the values distribute so we get the first impression of the data. Next step is now to connect the stage data with the element. So we add the load here. We select from the source systems what we want to do. And now I could take a business key, which is not the correct one. I take by accident out the category ID and I check for uniqueness and I check if this is the right business key and it will not only tell me that it's not the right business key, it will show me as well what are the duplicates. So it's telling me like some kind of tomatoes are there 14 times. I can open the sample data set and I can look into it and I will see that I have different product IDs for this 14 records, so that's maybe the right business key, so let's change that, test it again. And as this works out, so I skip a lot of, of stuff here, we can now create the hub load, we can create the satellite, the satellite load, and especially what's happening in the background is stuff that you probably don't expect, like creating tracking objects. So if somebody gets in the source system and will delete stuff, that's what we had in the data set, it will flag the record that it's not in the source anymore in the next full load, but it will not take it out of the output. It will just flag it because as we heard, we need to add it to the dimensions, but maybe we want to just highlight it. That's a product we are not selling anymore and we have all the information in the dimension. Or maybe if we are delivering the data later on as a data hub to a target system, maybe we want to really take it out of the delivery and say, no, you shouldn't deliver it anymore. Good, so we have two more minutes for questions. Anything special that you want to know right now? I understand if you change it in your model here, it will be directly reflected in the database itself. What happens if you uh, add any code columns, whatever? What happens if the data that has been already loaded appears in your raw world system? The cool thing is if you work according to data vault standards, nothing, because you will add new, co uh, the first the staging table will be anyway reloaded every time, so you can change it. The satellite, you would add a new satellite, and you get the new column from the time you add it, and then in the next interdimensional model, you would add it, to, add it to the output, and it would appear at the time that you do it. For sure, if I'm still in development, and I haven't deployed it, maybe I would create a new satellite, including the new column. I would go to the dimension model and swap out the satellite against the new satellite, but yes, then I would either need to manually migrate my data, but if I'm still in development, probably I don't need to do it, or I would accept that it's filled from that point in time. And if you, you said that you can you know, uh, jointly review data to customers, right? And uh, so you would like to, so, so if you want to reflect the new, new changes in the output data, you probably will have to reload the complete data from that stage, right? No, no, no. Uh, because this layer is primarily virtual, so let's assume oh. that we go here to the customer, and now we can just select from our model and say, okay, oh, we want to get it like from the address of residence, something, we go to the satellite, and we want to here add stuff, 
So we would just drag it in, store it, maybe let's do a more meaningful example like going like from the order. Um, Exactly, so here, and I can go just in, select, drag and drop some more stuff in here, store it, and then it will be available right away. If I do a business vault load and I materialize some kind of calculations, yet yeah, then I will need to rerun the business vault load, and then it would, would update the data. Have you shown uh, when the text changed? Uh, here, note that it was, uh, in my example, it was just uh, a data profiling on what the sex is. I, I didn't test it if it changes. We could create here, we have, <laughs> uh, I think we have a customer output for as it was, uh, with a STD, STD type two. And in here, if I would take in the attribute of the sex, I could go to the output table and query it if there are any changes on this attribute, but we would then see exactly when it happened by having here the load time and load time end in the output, so we would see how it was before. It's just STD type two output. If you would create something like STD type three or something, then you would do your query on top of it and, and, and add that. Any more questions? Okay, first thing, thank you for the question because we have no metadata repository. We eliminated that. Everything what I create here, this will create a view in the database and that the view exists defines that this element here exists. And if I export it, it will create one single file. So if we go to the business rule section and I take here some kind of a business rule, in that case it's just a select star is a view in the database. The view has all its metadata as comment stored on top of the view. So if you work in the database, you see exactly the same as in the front end. And when I export it in the deployment format, it will create one element containing the metadata, the ID, and the code that I have here as one single file. So every element, every hub, every link, every satellite gets its own file, every staging table gets its own files, Every so everything, it's its own file then in, in the export. Okay. I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you.